Okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com, and welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology. This TNR and the next four or five weeks are going to be replays from Room Now Live 2022. Room Now Live was held on March the 19th and 20th in Dallas, Texas. We had a great group of people attending live on site and many hundreds of you who watched the uh, streaming event. Um, we, in total, had almost 12 hours of CME that we're gonna replay for you in the next few weeks. So today's plan and the plan for the next few weeks is to go by topic. So our program is grouped into pods, what we might call sessions, two hour blocks dedicated to one particular topic. The topic tonight is rheumatoid arthritis and future improvements in therapy. We have three um, interesting talks by myself, Caleb Michaud and Ernest Choi. Um, and we're gonna cover a lot of different topics in RA. At Room Now Live, at the end of the session, we had another half hour of Q&A. What I'd like to do is to have you take in this content and for us to discuss it at the end. So I've taken excerpts from each of these 30 minute lectures and bundled it, to get, bundled it all together about 15 or 10 minutes from each session. So I got 41 minutes of video we're gonna run through um, starting in a few minutes. And then at the end, we'll discuss whatever questions you may have from this session. We're gonna cover a lot of different ground. I want to thank our sponsor of this session, Avvi. Um, they've been a sponsor of Room Now Live since the beginning, our prime sponsor, in fact. Uh, and they're sponsoring this program this week and next week's program on psoriatic arthritis. So with that said, I think it's time to actually get started. So let's take this down. And our first speaker is someone uh, well known to all of us, and that would be me. And let me see if I can find this particular recording, because now I have it. Um, here we go. All right. This is the clunkiness of doing Zoom these days. Here we go. All right. So our first speaker is going to be me, and I'm going to be talking about patients who have difficult or refractory RA and my particular approach in, in dealing with that. So, and it's going to be, we're going to go straight through three different lectures, each about 10 to 15 minutes. Hang in there. I want you to put your questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you're watching this on live stream, you can put in your questions on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and we'll also discuss them here during the program. So let's begin with my lecture. But in fact, it does. Um, Taliki Soko used to work with Ted Pincus, went back to Finland, and this is one of her studies that she All right, we're gonna start over at that session right there. The question is, what's wrong with this picture? And I think it boils down to wrong diagnosis, wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong doctor. And for each of these, there's actually an approach. I'm gonna tell you three things that you can do with wrong diagnosis. There's things to consider under wrong drug, same for wrong patient and same for wrong doctor. Let me show you what I, uh, my approach to this. So wrong diagnosis. Again, this doesn't happen to any of us, but in fact it does. Um, Tuliki Soko used to work with Ted Pincus, went back to Finland, and this is one of her studies that she published on 435 consecutive early seronegative RA, SNRA, seronegative RA. And the 10-year follow-up of these patients is what? 3% were became erosive or became seropositive, clearly RA. 32% could not be reclassified, meaning that they stayed as seronegative RA. But 65% in 10 years changed their diagnosis. And, and here's the most common one, PMR, PSA, spondy, OA. One of our speakers in the, in the 
next step talk or TED talk is Ronan Kavanaugh. He, I think, famously said once that one of his coaches and mentors told him, every time you see a zero negative is your opportunity to ask the question, is this really RA? Because unless you ask that question repeatedly, you may very well miss the diagnosis. So there are misdiagnoses, and this is a hodgepodge of things in some of that which were on the prior list. But these are the things that should be kept in the back of your mind. We've all seen patients who are seronegative RAs, and oh, then they develop inflammatory bowel disease, right? I think that these are often unified by being more atypical in presentation, a longer time to make the diagnosis, unresponsive to DMARDs or biologics, or they have reactions to everything. Then the point is that I think you're dealing with something more than what you've been calling RA and maybe another diagnosis. Okay, what about wrong drug? This is really what most of us do. We think, well, I'm just going to keep switching drugs. Uh, at Artie's meeting uh, a few weeks ago in Maui, RWCS, I asked a faculty panel a difficult case. I gave them this case of one longstanding disease. She'd been on 15 DMARs. She had like 900 comorbidities. It was a case from hell. And of course, nothing is working in her anymore. I was impressed. The point of my, my presentation then was, at some point, you throw in you know, the towel and say, no, uh, enough. Meaning another DMARD isn't going to fix this situation. But my faculty panel said, there's four more DMARDs we haven't yet tried. Isn't it worth doing that? And I don't know that that's the case. My point is that people that you call difficult RA is not always going to respond to another drug, another DMR, another biologic. So we got lots of choices. But think about it. You know, on, on this list, there's 22 FDA approved um, biologics and conventional DMARDs. And if you've only done 15, do you have to go through the other seven? Or do you need to wait for the next four to come along to be the savior to your DT? All right. This is how I approach people that I call kitchen sink failures when I don't really know what to do and I'm going to just try another biologic. This, I think, works better for me. This has worked better for me. But often that's about, you know, your limitations on what you do. This is about being limited by a, um, a comorbidity. Patients come and at this point in, in the story, you can't give them what you want to give them because they have these comorbidities. And for each of these, there's a correct choice and there's a wrong choice. And I can spend three hours going over what I think is the, the wrong choice and what I think is the right choice. In the case of diverticulitis, you don't want to use prednisone, a JAK or an IL-6, right? That makes sense. Anybody who wants this slide, it's in your handout. I'm going to put it on room now on Monday. You can download it and use it and look at it and, and argue with me about it. But I think that this is one construct for dealing with um, that situation. The other situation is where can I find an advantage? There are two situations. One is seropositivity. We all have the data. There are drugs that we use that really aren't 
impacted at all by whether the patient's seropositive or not. TNF inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, um, usual DMARs don't really aren't affected here. But there's good data to say that if you're seropositive, you may get as much as 10% more response by using rituximab or abitassa, or maybe even a JAK inhibitor with recent data that's coming out. And it works best when this is your er, guides your early choices, you might get even more than 10%. When it's later choices, you might get up to 10%. But is that not better than what I'm going to do in my next choice where I'm gonna flip a coin and it's 50-50, it's probably less than 50-50? Use this advantage. The other way to get an advantage is to use machine learning and big data. There's, you know, um, those of us who go to the meeting and watch what happens to ACR and ULR, there's a growing number of abstracts on artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it's overwhelming, and it often is very confusing, and it often goes nowhere. So I'm going to give you one nice study that looks at ceruliumab, and in this particular study, they looked at four of their trials that were used in development of ceruliumab. They developed a, um, a rule, and the rule was developed based on all the variables, clinical variables they had, and they showed what would show us a difference between an IL-6 response and a TNF response. And the rule was being ACPA positive and being CRP positive. Now, this is an IL-6 inhibitor. The data that says that patients with high CRP are going to respond better to IL-6 is actually not there. It's, you know, sometimes maybe, but usually it doesn't pan out. But maybe if you combine it with ACPA, now it gets to be predictive. So in their target trial, they had over 300 patients. The number who responded to an ACR20 response was 67%. If you now use the rule and look at CCP positivity, the 67 goes to 72. If you add in the CRP greater than 12.3 milligrams per liter, it now goes up 14 points to 81%. This is where big data will better characterize for you maybe what your next choice is. But it's gonna take a lot of big data and a lot of different therapeutic areas that you can plug in your data and get an answer. But I think you're gonna see this in the future. Wrong patient. Well, they're kind of easy to spot, are they not? Um, and um, I got into handwriting analysis and whatnot. And the guy that taught me handwriting analysis has this thing called hell traits, which I really like the sound of. It sounded like a number of my patients. So I made up my own uh, hell traits list that has nothing to do with handwriting analysis, but has to do with certain behaviors. So the non-compliant ones, you know, they won't go, they don't show, they can't do, they got, you know, they're just. Next, negativistic thinking. I, I call that diabolical negativism. I wrote, and people who think like this, you know who they are. You tell them, listen, the risk of getting PML with rituximab with RA is one in 30,000. They go, that's me, doc, I'm going to get it. And I tell them, you're not that special. You're just Mr. One in 30,000. No, you don't understand, Doc. I get all the bad stuff. And people are get mired by this. And I have a blog called Diabolical Negativism that, approach, that it sort of has an approach to that. Poor patient managers. I sent them to my other blog on being CEO of your own health. Because most people are not good managers of their own health. And they need to learn that. Poor sleepers, often depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, chronic pain sinkers. And, and then on the special group, the vaccinots, the magical thinkers, the different drummers, you know, join the club, pay the dues, but those people are not going to help you get over your problem. Identifying these people, you know, there are things to do with some of them, but they can be hard. I think it's better to recognize the fact that not all patients are going to be uh, well managed just based on their phenotype. Meaning you can look at patients, you don't know that they're not going to respond or they're go or whether they will respond great. Often some of the most active patients we have respond the best to the therapies we use. So phenotype doesn't help you very much. Um, I think we should be more in favor of self-management, self-efficacy schemes. You know, these are in some of the guidelines, that, uh, but yet we don't really approach this. This is about empowering the patient. Uh, and why? Because, you know, the patients, when they assess themselves, that's often different than the way you assess them. They're driven by pain. You're driven by swelling. You know, what's important to them is not necessarily important to you. So, you know, encouraging them to get involved with a support group, uh, you know, use a mobile app. Caleb has written about that. Um, you know, lifestyle issues, exercise, mental health, CBT, 
you know, identifying cycle. These are all gigantically important in patient outcome, and we pay really no attention to this. And this stuff becomes even more important in these difficult patients. What's your role? Your role is educating them and supporting them. You know, I say my goal in, in treating my patients is to give them hope, goals, and rules. That means I have an obligation to them in that visit to give them hope, goals, and rules. I mean, I got to talk about stuff that guides them one step closer to proper use of their drug, but also maybe other, other things like lifestyle. So let's get into another case. 45-year-old um, female, um, seropositive, on methotrexate, prednisone, a JAK inhibitor, hydroxychloroquine, failed a lot of drugs, now has one hour of stiffness, has polyarthritis, polyarthralgia, that's her hands. She's failed methotrexate, plaquil, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, adalimumab, serlizumab, avatacept, nonsteroidals, et cetera. Past medical history of shingles, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, has mild inflammation. What are you going to do? So that's a polling question. What are you going to do? Okay, so what is your next best option? You can see them here on screen. You can either change to sub-Q methotrexate, order a sleep restudy, change to another JAK inhibitor, use rituximab, or get another opinion, maybe another rheumatologist. Again, remember this patient has zero positive disease, has failed a lot of therapy, hydroxychloroquine, sulfazalazine, methotrexate, loflunamide, adalimumab, sertilizumab, abatacept, and nonsteroidals. All right, here come the answers. Look at this. Leading the way, you love to use rituximab. Well, in fact, most of you don't use rituximab um, in RA, but in this situation, when the patient's failed almost everything, seems that you're going to lean on that compared to going to parenteral sub or subcutaneous methotrexate. Um, lowest on the list is change to a different JAK inhibitor and get a room second opinion. Well, this is actually all about getting a second opinion. And, you know, there are times when it's really a, a wrong doctor issue. And the question is, what are your options when you're wanting to get another doctor involved? Remember, you know, you can't be successful on everyone. You can't hit a home run on everyone. And there are this 10% of patients of difficult to treat RA patients where you're just not going to in your first, second, third, fourth try get it right. You know too well as a rheumatologist that delays in referral lead to poorer outcomes. If you delay the option of sending this to someone else and getting another opinion, then you're contributing to the problem. Rheumatologists should consider second opinions. Now we do this all the time if we have partners or if we work in a large group. I was talking just yesterday with Philip Malloy and we talked about what we do in our communities and whatnot. And he was talking about, you know, city rounds where rooms get together and present difficult cases. This is like the ideal, best, friendliest fellowship form of getting a second opinion. It works really well. It's timely if you have these conferences on a regular basis. This also works if you're in a medical school environment or an academic center where rheumatologists are getting together in clinical conferences where they can, in fact, refer patients to or talk about patients with each other instead of actually doing the big referral. There are several other options. Um, I think in the future, we're going to be seeing more peer-to-peer internet-based virtual consultation. Uh, it's going on now. It happens at the Cleveland Clinic. It happens at um, major centers, and it can be billed back to the patient. What we do see is that you can get this done and, and send it to another colleague. And getting things on the colleague is actually really beneficial. Often what's going to happen is the um, diagnosis may not change, but the treatment options and other thoughts um, are going to be new to both the patient and you. So consider sending the patient to another physician. Listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis, William Osler. That's really important in managing these people. You need to have that sort of approach. Uh, again, we do have this sort of... Uh, um, inequality between what patients think and what you think. And we really should get into more shared decision-making where you're asking the patient actively, what do you want? What are your goals? What's your understanding of what we're doing here? Um, so why chronic disease needs shared decision-making more than anyone. Um, often they're being asked to make decisions, complex decisions about therapy. 
And, and, and you know, while 96% of people say that they want to know more, half of them are going to actually let you make the decision for them. But that does mean half of them want to have a vote. No, I don't want to take, you know, a cancer drug. So uh, patients are actively involved. There's complex options. Um, there's, they choose the care they prefer, they prefer. I think that why should you do this? Patients view themselves as being the expert of themselves. And this inequality, this knowledge asymmetry between the physician and the patient really begs for the patient to be involved more. And it is certainly more respectful. So what happens? Do patients do better with, with shared decision-making? Not a lot of data on that, but they do better as far as compliance and adherence. They are more motivated by being more knowledgeable. There's a low, there are studies showing lower cost of care and there's higher patient satisfaction. And again, this could be a team approach. You need decision aids. Decision aids are things like this. You know, these are handouts explaining the key decisions that the patient needs to make. You don't want to send them for a course in epidemiology. You want to give them what information they can in fact understand. So lastly, I think physicians do make mistakes. My pet peeves are aiming for monotherapy. Uh, I think that's silly. I think actually uh, ratcheting down therapy and stopping therapy, I think that's even sillier, if not dumber. Again, this is a highly complex disease. You spent your whole life trying to manage to think that you can reduce this to single drug therapy and or to withdrawing drug therapy is foolish. The play into that is to invite the devil into your household, meaning they're gonna flare, they're gonna do badly. Not maximizing drugs that you commonly use. Steroids, they, you know, in these typical cases they're needed, but is it worth it? Is, which is worse, the slow dose steroid you're gonna use or uh, you know, not using the steroid, it's a bit of a problem. And then waiting to change, we are often difficult of making slow decisions. So what's wrong with this picture? Wrong diagnosis, wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong doctor. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Caleb Michaud from Moving along. So that, that's correct. <laughs> Basically, it's it's somewhere uh, around 80% or 50%, depending on what type of patient they're at and where they're at. Uh, and it's spot on. And the WHO was not meant to throw you off because a lot of times, actually, it is 50%. Uh, and, and yeah, I would carry on a little bit more. So when I talk to this, to a lot of the doctors that I work with, they basically would just say, the patients take what I prescribed. It's great. They do exactly what I tell them, which is, you know, there's no follow-up, right? It's just sort of assumed at 100%. And then any failure, the why things didn't work is because it's the patient's fault, not the doctor's fault here. So we did a couple of adherence studies that I'm gonna talk about here. One was published a few years ago in ACR Open. Another one was just presented last year at ACR Convergence. And in both cases, we invited participants around the US in the Forward Data Bank and I'll give you just what already mentioned here. Uh, Fred Wolf is my mentor. He started the NDB back in 1998, and he made this statement uh, a few years ago when we were interviewing him. He said, I started the NDB in part to figure out what happened to my patients that didn't come back. And this is something that Jack alluded to, but didn't really get to. If you look at your patients long-term, you start collecting measures over and over again, you will find that they do better. What you won't find is what happened to the patients who didn't come back. Right, uh, And it is sort of a, a bias over time because they come back to you because they are doing better. They like what's happening here. And the ones that, that don't usually don't come back or unless they don't have another option. And the NDB, or we, I renamed it Forward a few years ago, it's still an independent nonprofit research organization uh, and still one of the largest, even though we have not recruited new patients through the whole pandemic. So we are hurting that way. I invite you to go to the website down below, forwarddatabank.org. We're always looking for new sites who want to help contribute more patients. But uh, what we did in this process is we followed patients with large questionnaires a couple times a year through the patient, not through the clinics, so we could see what's happened to them over time. And we invited these folks who had started methotrexate, which is hard to find these days because most people have been on already and already failed or have moved on to something else. Uh, we started methotrexate. We mailed them a bottle an electronic cap bottle, a MEMS cap, uh, and then gave them a questionnaire and then six months later, got the bottle back. And from that, we could figure out how adherent they were or not. Uh, and this is sort of shows you what that MEMS bottle shows the, the analyst here. This is an example from um, 
over here we have the tofacitinib monotherapy. And this is somebody who is very adherent and persistent. They took their pill every day in the morning, very consistently over six months or nine months in this case. Here's an example of somebody who was not persistent um, because they stopped, but they were very adherent. And you can see the methotrexate, which is once a week. And here's somebody who started seeing overdosing and underdosing. So I don't use the term overdosing in the paper just because it sounds a little, a little too far off. And so forth. But this is what we see when we see those MEMS devices. And, and what we found, for the most part, the correct dosing was around 80%, and then underdosing 20, a little off, and then early, so early dosing instead of overdosing, uh, which is a little scary when it comes to methotrexate, as, you, as, it, as it should be. Uh, and it surprised me because these are already biased patients. They've already started the drug, so they've already initiated it. And in some cases, they've been taking it for months already. Uh, and even people who've been taking it, adherence was at 80%. So this just would be like your best case scenario. Only 25% of people in there took it consistently correct, same day, every once a week for six months. And these are like the best of the best. So I, I put 80% adherence as the top, like what you could expect of your best patients. And it's most likely to be closer to 50%. Uh, and then recent study from last fall, we looked at tofacitinib. Now this is versus a sub -Q TNF, And again, very similar results. And then we found a little bit of difference with the methotrexate that was concomitant with either that helped improve, which surprised me. And the summary of this is that the, the adherence to tofacitinib is about the same as a TNF sub Q injectables. And this is like a big bottle with a big cap on top of the deposit in. That methotrexate improved tofacitinib adherence it doesn't mean you should prescribe methotrexate to people who are taking tofacitinib. I think this is means that these are folks who are used to taking methotrexate consistently, and therefore they're used to taking pills. We did find that if you took your tofa in the, and methotrexate either way in the morning, you were more adherent than in the evening. Why is that? Because it's one of the first things you do, right? In the morning with breakfast, you have it there as part of your schedule, you can control it. You never know when you're going to have dinner sometimes. It might be off, and I mean, depending where it's at, where you're at. That, that's my reasoning there. You sort of see the, we call them wobblers, the folks who do it in the afternoon or evening. And what Jack alluded to is the patient global was the most important factor in predicting discontinuation and poor adherence. Patient global. Uh, as, as far as things that you might be able to control, uh, age, sex, um, and uh, race were also important. So, what do you do to ensure that good initiation and adherence to the medications you prescribed? This is a poll. Do you debrief on the medication plan with the patient? You can answer multiple time, multiple choices this time. Do you use an adherence tool in your clinic? Do you pull pharmacy dispensing records? Do you have a follow-up outreach beyond the clinic visit about getting the medications? Do you rely on a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager, specialty pharma, and big pharma? Do you cross your fingers and hope for the best, i.e. your patients do exactly what you tell them to do? So in the US at least, everybody relies on pharma now on the, on the specialty meds, believe it or not. So debrief, that's great. And that's, that's good. That's definitely a start. It's a good sign. Outreach beyond, that's fantastic. But for the most part, those of us who are on things that aren't over the counter, easy to access pharmacy, DMARDs, CSD marts, we deal with the specialty pharmacy. We deal with other phone calls and emails and texts as a patient all the time. And what you may or may not know <clears throat> is we're dealing with nurses now that are asking about how we're doing that have nothing to do with my rheumatologist. And most of the time, they don't even know that we're having these interactions. But the drug companies want to make sure that the patients stay on these drugs. And so therefore, we end up talking to these folks more than we actually talk to the rheumatology clinic. And they've done this to improve adherence because you don't have time to do so. But debriefing on the medication plan is fantastic. So we talked about changing therapy. You want an efficacious DMARD. You want a treat-to-target strategy. 
get great outcomes. Fantastic, we've got it, no problem. Real world evidence is not so fast. And back in 2007, Fred and I published this paper called Resistance of RA Patients to Changing Therapy. And the main results of this is that we found so many people who had poor disease control, worse disease activity in RA were not taking the new, at that time, biologics. And we didn't understand why it was happening. The biggest reason was the patients feared loss of control and the worse getting worse. The idea that they could be okay with sort of this moderate disease activity as long as it sort of seemed to be stable at some level. And that you kept on finding all of these swollen joints that weren't being addressed. So we did a follow-up to this this last year. Uh, we got the data last year, presented at ACR. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole study because there's about 40 single space pages of this and I'm still getting all ready for publication. But we found very similar results. Um, what this is showing is what, what things seem to say the same and the strongest is that the risk of side effects, the doctors think the current medications are the, are the best the, and the fear of loss of control and there's no better medication are by far the strongest um, uh, associated with refusing to, to consider a change in DMAR. Because it's one thing for you to think the patient needs a different drug, it's another thing for them to actually take it. And then over here, we have a spider ham sort of looking at all the different questions here. And I'll move on here. The main results here is that, you know, between the 2006 and the 2021 update, and this showed when I actually paired the people who actually filled out both questionnaires. So it is definitely a, a, a longer lived subset that the satisfaction with medications had increased over time. Uh, the satisfaction with control has decreased, which sort of goes against each other. Uh, unwilling to change has decreased. And that we see this happening more and more when there's more drugs available and more likely to change and try more drugs. Um, very satisfied with medications, yet high disease activity, pretty high. So we have 35% high disease activity, yet very satisfied with medications. And yet similar weaker associations, the cost insurance factors seem to have disappeared compared to 2006. And I mean, I, I think as a patient for me, I went from having to pay 20% of my drug cost to now like $5 a month, which is a huge change for me. And it's, it's not that the drugs got lowered, it's just a very different, you know, how those things are paid for. There is a resistance by mechanism of action and then whether it's sub-Q or IV as well. So <clears throat> in summary, the Physician Global changes the DMR prescription. So you, what your gestalt is on the patient is what most likely leads to a DMR change. But I want to push out there that the, the patient global changes whether or not they stay on those drugs. So if you're not measuring that, you should be. I think a lot of people ask if they do a depression question. I think that just one or two mood questions will sometimes help as well, sort of that approach, because mood definitely impacts, your mood impacts how you're doing today with the patient, let alone here. Uh, the same with the patient as well, what they're going to remember. Many factors impact treatment effectiveness. Don't let you or your clinic negatively impact them. And this really goes back to the communication and education. So what are some of the pearls like with methotrexate? The fast, easy one without even thought should be, what's your methotrexate day? If they don't have a quick answer, you might need to have a longer conversation about what they're doing with correctly about their, you know, once a day methotrexate. Um, same with the, the sub-Q biologics, you know, if it's once every week or once every two weeks, what's your injection day? You know, when they should know that and have it down as a single day. If it's all over the place or whenever they feel like it, you should have a little uh, more conversation. I know that I start to get worried when I start to get sore and like, oh, I missed it. Uh, it was on my calendar, but, you know, Saturdays. So uh, that's all for this. Uh, our next speaker is Ernest Choi from Cardiff in Wales. Um, precision medicine was actually highlighted in this Nature Outlook article in 2016, first issue of the year. It kind of said that in the next decade, we will be completely into precision medicine. Now, the most important thing on the cover is on the bottom left-hand corner, and you can see the word alumina, because what it's kind of saying is that the availability of next generation sequencing as a technology is going to transform healthcare and help us to go into precision medicine. And many of uh, the talk during, and many of the slides during this talk 
rely on next generation sequencing technology. It is very powerful and useful. It gives us some superpowers, but not all the superpowers. It's not quite the superhero that we needed, as Jack alluded to uh, at this moment in time. Uh, as rheumatologists, we should be proud uh, because the first clinician that has been hailed as the person who leads on precision medicine is on the right-hand side, Archibald uh, Garrett. His research interest is genetics in rheumatic diseases, and he first uh, made the diagnosis of our capturea based on analysis of urine, showing that it is a genetically erased, uh, 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 associated disease. Now, Archibald Garrett's father is on the left-hand side, Sir Alfred Baron Garrett, who actually works at King's, a hospital that I used to work at. And he was the first person who used the term rheumatoid arthritis. At that time, there were very common chronic destructive arthritis. And Sir Alfred Baron Garrett did an experiment. He took urine from patients with chronic destructive arthritis. He put a string in the urine and he realized that in some patients, they have crystal deposit in the urine overnight, while there are patients who did not. And he reasoned that these conditions are caused by two different mechanisms. Of course, the patient with the crystal deposit in the urine had chronic gout and the patient who did not have crystal deposit in the urine had rheumatoid arthritis. So this is precision medicine, is diagnosing the right pathology based on what causing the disease. So the tasks that we have today are slightly different. Uh, we think that we can diagnose rheumatoid arthritis with a combination of clinical criteria blood tests. What we are struggling with is that we have we are spoiled for choice. We have so many different treatments, they're expensive, and we are giving treatment by trial and error. Can we come up with a tool that will predict which patient will respond to which treatment? I think this is the challenge that Jack put to us uh, earlier uh, today. And maybe because we are cycling medications inappropriately, it drives the development of refractory RA. In fact, in Maya's article, uh, she discussed that potential pitfall about using treatment by trial and error. Now, Jack has alluded to this already. We have some relative marker of predicting response to treatment. This is about rituximab, and we know that seropositive patients tend to respond better to rituximab. The problem is that, of course, if you are seronegative, it doesn't say that you don't respond, it's just that you don't respond as well. So it's not an absolute yes or no, but if they're seropositive, you're more likely to respond to rituximab. And the same is true for Batasap. So you could use it uh, perhaps to think about because most patients with rheumatoid arthritis we see in clinic tend to be seropositive, you can think about the opposite. What am I going to do in patients who are double negative, both rheumatoid factor negative, ACPA negative, some rheumatologists will consider they don't have the same disease as the seropositive patient. So you may go towards the anti-cytokine therapy for this because we know that for TNF inhibitor, for example, they have equal response independent of uh, seropositivity status. So that's a relative thing. Uh, but I think the, uh, I'm going to highlight the study that I was involved with, but was uh, led by Constantino Pasalis in the UK. It was one of the study when we conducted synovial biopsies in patients with rheumatoid arthritis right at the time of diagnosis before the patient started treatment. And we biopsied a lot of people in this study, 144 patients. Uh, and as you know, synovial biopsy is an invasive procedure. You may not think that the patient would be acceptable to them to undergo such an invasive procedure. But this study proved to be quite informative to highlight the heterogeneity uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. So the first thing we notice in this patient who right at the time of diagnosis is that the pathology in the joints are different. And in fact, it highlighted some study that has done in established RA to show that in fact, 
histologically, there are patients who don't have many inflammatory infiltration. There are those that have a diffuse uh, infiltration mainly of myeloid, that is monocytes and macrophages in the inflamed joint. And then at the bottom, a uh, pathology that is typical with lymphoid aggregates with foci that has a, a, a high percentage of T and B cells, so a very highly organized uh, structure. And with next generation sequencing, it's possible to look at the gene expression in the whole synovium and look at every single gene that has been transcribed. And you can look at the different pathotype and show that the pattern of genes expressed in this synovium actually differ from one another, although there is significant overlap among this type. But it kind of starts to suggest that not only the presence of cells are different, but these cells are doing something slightly different in the individual patients. And in fact, with modern bioinformatics, and this is an important part of the technology too, is that when we start to have so much data, so uh, a gene transcriptome may give you 500,000 different gene transcripts, it's not something that you can analyze the traditional method. It is uh, the combination of that uh, bioinformatic analysis that allow you to start to understand what the data mean, you can actually look at the genes transcript and try to map it to genes that you expect from different cell types on the right hand side are showing what you would expect the signature of different cell type to understand whether the gene signature is mapping to the function of these uh, cells. And to prove that the gene transcript have some relevant, uh, this analysis look at on the left hand side, the gene transcript associated with ACPA positivity on the left and on the right, patients who would progress to get more severe arthritis. So the vertical axis show you the statistical scoring. And because there are so many genes, the log uh, uh, P score needs to be fairly high and anything that has been adjusted to be positive are uh, indicated in blue. On the bottom are change in the gene expression. So at the center is zero. If you move towards the uh, right hand side, is an increase in gene uh, expression. If you move towards the left hand side, is a decrease in gene expression. So what these slides are showing is that in the zero positive patient, they have a very different gene pattern of expression that is different from zero negative patient. And on the right hand side, you can pick out genes that are associated with progression and genes that are associated with non-progression. So genes that may well be protecting the patient from more severe damage. Now, in this study, what it shows is that these genetic uh, well, and in fact, transcriptomic market was able to add to the known clinical variable that will predict uh, progression. So on the left hand side are the radiographic uh, sharp scores, and you can see yes or no progress or not progress. And you can see that the different uh, pattern of a pathotype was associated with different rate of progression and the lymphoid pathotype was the group that particularly tend to progress. On the right hand side is a rock curve showing that if you add the, this genes to the clinical variable, you can increase the prediction of whether patient will progress or not. So it kind of said that the genetic marker may well help us to classify uh, patients better than the traditional clinical biomarkers. And in fact, this analysis was very intensive. On the left hand side, you can actually take individual score, tender joint count, swollen joint count, ultrasound score, and try to map it to the activity of different cell type 
in the joint that you pack up the signature. And in red shows very strong correlation, in blue show no correlation at all. And they try to infer what the roles of different uh, cell type may well be doing in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a very, very powerful tool and for the first time provide some validation that in fact, more detailed next generation sequencing analysis map onto the clinical features of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And last but not least in this study, because these patients have all been just been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, they were started on methotrexate. And in fact, they tried to use the gene, uh, the transcriptomic cathotype signature and found that the signature was associated with whether the patient will respond well to methotrexate in that the patient with the PASI immune phenotype are uh, the group that are least likely to respond well to methotrexate. So we provide a lot of validation of this notion that we try to express in the article that I wrote together with uh, Artie a while ago is that even at the time of diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, the pathobiology within the joint is heterogeneous. And because it's heterogeneous, the type of cell presence and the kind of activities these cells are doing are really different in patients. And therefore, not surprising, we don't have a universal panacea that drives response in every single patient. So the diagnosis is the same, but the pathobiology is different. Okay, folks, that was uh, Dr. Ernest Choi uh, and his lecture, which we cut short um, to give you a taste of that. At the, re at the rest of his lecture, which had another, I'd say, 15 minutes, he discussed new studies on the gut and microbiome showing its predictive value in choosing maybe the right therapy. Again, a lot of this is um, new information, evolving information. Um, but it's compelling. Uh, it could very well be um, what our future is going to um, be about when it comes to managing RA in the future. So in the time we have left, I want to encourage you to um, bring forward any questions you may have. Um, I have a number of questions um, <clears throat> that I've received already. Um, and uh, you can add to that by putting your question into the Q&A box here in the webinar or if you are watching a live stream, uh, you can put it in the uh, comments box, whether you're on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Um, we had a question from the audience about what's the, way, the best way to improve adherence in our patients. You know, that's really what this whole session was about, is was it not, you know, the shocker that our patients don't take medicines as we, um, as we'd like them to. And then you wonder, is that why they get difficult refractory disease? I don't think it's entirely true. I think that you can have some degree of noncompliance and still do very well. You know, 25% of people were perfectly compliant according to Caleb, but I don't think you need to be perfectly compliant to get the benefit of, of the drug that we use. It's a little bit like driving. Maybe only 25% of people really do drive within the speed limit. Doesn't mean that you know, 75% of you are reckless and going crazy out there. But anyway, the answer to the question, um, do you, you know, what would you do? I think it starts with trust. First off, I'd say it's not going to be what you all voted for, which was 61% said debrief the patient on the drugs. Clearly that doesn't work. You've got to do better and do different. It's all about trust. So if it's a brand new patient, you're going to have a hard time you know, getting compliance because they're still evaluating you, you know, whether they like the way you behave or your delivery or your confidence or the smell of the office, the front office personnel. I mean, they're looking for nine reasons not to rely on you, you know, and of course, um, the best lesson on being the best doctor I got from relatives who've been sick recently, and they tell me a great doctor is someone who cares and it shows. They hold their hand, put their arm around you, they say, I'm going to take care of you. Please 
give me a chance. We're going to get through this together, even though what you give them is a ton of information and whatnot. So it's trust and it comes with time. I think the other answers are um, shared decision making. You need to invest in that and what that means. I mean, you need the patient to verbalize their understanding. If they say, you know, if you ask them, what does this mean to you? Spit back from you what we're going to be doing here with therapy. And then they don't, then they're not buying in. You need to know what's the story they're telling themselves. And if they get it, they'll be able to spit it back to you and verbalize it. It helps if you use decision aids, handouts, because it's either your one page handout on why they should take methotrexate versus the eight pages they're going to get of every little side effect that's ever been reported when they get their handout from CVS, the pharmacy. That's a big problem, right? Um, I, yeah, I, again, I think it's, um, it really is time and trust and how you get trust is going to be different than, than everybody else. Um, I, um, we have a, a question, Vectra um, can help with um, some of these biologies. Um, I've never ordered Vectra, I don't need Vectra. If I wanna know what's going on with IL-6 levels, I order CRP. Um, TNF levels, you really can't measure and TNF's not measured in Vectra. Vectra looks at 12 different um, components and puts it together into a score. And it's not a biomarker, meaning there are no studies that show you can predict the future. All the studies they show that predict the future are studies based on where they already knew the outcome and they applied and they could have used CRP as their measure or SED rates and said they used Vectra and showed you what you would have known if you'd used SED rate and CRP. A biomarker is a study that shows that patients are treated according to DAS or patients are treated according to Vectra or patients are treated, treated according to whatever doctors want. And then prospectively, you prove that Vectra is as good as any one of those others or better than, then you got a biomarker. Vectra, Prism, RA are not biomarkers. Sorry, um, I don't waste my time and money on things that don't make me smarter, especially when patient information is as smart as you get, measuring disease activity measures and using them serially to make decisions is as smart as you get. And then the shared decision-making and having a, a, a reasonable conversation with the patients. Um, I agree with uh, Stella that you really can't get um, pathology. Those are obviously, you know, medical center investigations, but this really is about developing um, information that tells you where you might go, right? I think you can do better on outcomes if you have uh, something that is predictive, like the rheumatoid factor, like the rule developed with cerilumab where it's ACVA plus a CRP of greater than 12.3 milligrams per, deciliter, per liter says that you're more likely to respond to an IL-6 inhibitor than a TNF inhibitor. Um, you know, there were studies that Dr. Choi talked about in his um, later part of his talk where they did synovial biopsies and showed if you had B-cell rich synovial biopsies are more likely to respond to rituximab than to an IL-6 inhibitor. But you know, we're looking for either machine learning, AI prediction rules. We're looking for um, a profile. And we know there is no clinical profile that helps us predict who's gonna to respond to what therapy. When you're choosing a therapy, as good as you are, and you rheumatologists are great, you're flipping a coin. That's what I'm doing. And that's why I don't like the next drug company to come along with the next drug that tells me it's the greatest thing. It's as good as the drugs that I'm already using. And I don't know better how to use the new drug than I did the old drugs. You know, what drives the equation? I got samples in the refrigerator. That really shouldn't be the science upon which you make decisions. So um, anyway, I think um, adherence is important to success. And if we could optimize that, I think that would be um, helpful. Um, uh, is there, uh, let's see. Um, so can you get better information? Deepak Gupta asked a question. Can you get better information from synovial fluid than, can you get, than you get from synovial tissue? Well, both are difficult to obtain. Synovial fluid may be good at some things and less uh, effective at others. The cell populations, as you know, in synovial fluid is mostly polys. 
um, the cell population and tissues are mostly mononuclear cells, mostly lymphocytes, those myeloid cells. So I don't think that there's going to be a biomarker or an indication on therapy based on synovial fluid, which would be easier to identify. Um, question about what's the best clue in differentiating CPPD from seronegative RA with persistent synovitis? I think that's a call of, and we're talking about seronegative RA and chronic disease. I think that's a call of either the x-ray findings, a good musculoskeletal radiologist should be able to easily tell you the difference um, by x-ray, not MR or anything else, but by x-ray. And even ultrasound has distinct differences. Um, but I would say certainly x-ray is the best way. Hook osteophytes, um, um, peri-capsular um, calcification, um, you know, triangular ligament calcification, but, and those are things you don't generally get in RA. So things that are relatively specific is a good way of, 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 of talking about. Um, um, Hell traits, what do you, um, what, should we be doing more about depression um, um, in, uh, in assessing our patients? And I think that's a really good suggestion um, from one of our listeners that we don't screen for depression. We do a hack score. You know, we give them the, the questionnaire or they, they fill out in the office. Your questionnaire should have one question. Are you depressed? You know, or you could do the eight question Beck inventory. You know, if you really wanted to get a feel for how depressed people are. I saw a patient today who denied depression, denied anhedonia, meaning she said that she still was interested in sex and she still was interested in her hair and how it looked. Anhedonia means you're no longer interested in the things that you normally would be very interested in. And that's one good key clinical question for depression. But she denied anhedonia, but boy, her psychomotor retardation and everything else about her history said there is an element of depression going on. So that may not be something we treat today, but it might be something we address um, serially in the next several visits. So. Um, any more questions? Um, uh, I might, I think I have a list here of other things. If you have, you can actually write it into the Q&A box. That would be um, really helpful. I do want to mention at the beginning of my lecture on difficult to treat RA, I defined difficult to treat RA, which generally means patients who failed multiple therapies and you and the patient both agree that it's difficult to treat RA. Um, is a ULAR definition of that. Um, I also say that, you know, um, you need to know that 10% of the RA population, everybody's RA population meets this definition. And so you're going to need a strategy. That's why I present my strategy of going through the checklist of um, wrong drug, wrong disease, wrong doctor, wrong diagnosis. Therein, you might find some answers on what you might be doing next, as opposed to just using all the remaining DMARs that they've not yet tried. That would be I think a wrong decision because there is this diminishing return phenomenon, right? You know the data, all the studies show 60, 40, 20 ACR responses in who? Patients, RA patients, failing methotrexate going on their first advanced therapy, 60% get an ACR 20, 40% get an ACR 50, 20% get an ACR 70. But if they fail that first TNF inhibitor or first biologic, so what's the next one look like as far as ACR 20, 50, 70 responses? It's not 60, 40, 20. It's, it's 50, 30, 15. And the next one, 40, 25, 5. So there is, with each set of failures of drugs, there's a, a, a rate of diminishing returns on your next drug, which is why if you've already been tried on six DMARDs and five biologics, giving you the sixth or seventh biologic or biosimilar makes no sense, right? So um, I think that that's kind of what I would recommend um, in how to best consider these people. Someone asked if FORWARD is a US study or international, it is US. Um, medication diary apps, helpful. They might be, I don't know of a good study that says that you should do it. Um, and um, uh, what do I think of Rayos and Akthar? 
be very expensive. Oh, I'm editing myself right now. Totally useless steroids. They're not proven to be better than the cheap stuff you prescribe. They're just more expensive and make money for the stockholders and people who work for that company. Why would you even consider it? There are no studies showing the efficacy of either Rayos or, yeah they, yeah, they work, but do they better work better than what you can use on your own? No, they do not. Gigantic waste of time. I, 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 I love to scoff at their use. Um, there is a question, uh, I'll end with this question on what is, what do you think about the use of 2.5 milligrams of prednisone? And um, if you see me give my recent drug safety lecture, I've shown the data that says even at doses of one, two, three, and four milligrams, RA patients have a statistically significant higher rate of cardiovascular events that includes heart failure and AFib um, and not necessarily MI and a significantly higher rate of hospitalization with serious infections. So yeah, the higher the dose, the more the risk. But to say that you're at five or less doesn't mean that you're totally devoid of risk. We need to do better with no steroids or as low as you can possibly go would be my advice. Um, anyway, I wanna end by showing you what we're doing next week um, in our program, I want to show you a slide of our um, um, program for next week, Tuesday at Rheumatology on the May 10th. We'll send you an invite on uh, through your email through Room Now uh, to participate in their webinar. You can also live stream it on YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Next week, we have our pod or session on psoriatic arthritis. Marty Cavanaugh talking about PSA guidelines, good, bad, and ugly. Bruce Kirkham from the UK talking about drug targeting in, in psoriatic arthritis. And Alexis Ogdi from Penn talking about real world data and registries in psoriatic arthritis and what can be gleaned from them. Uh, wanna thank Abby for sponsoring this program and also next week's program. Tell your folks that they can watch this uh, on, we'll be posting all of these talks on the Room Now channel, our YouTube channel, and also on our podcast. Thanks very much, folks. We'll see you next week. Take care and goodbye.